Everyone gets a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Deborah Dubray has been on Bump in the Road before. Deborah rose from secretary to CEO in a construction business and subsequently sold it for $20 million. But what would follow? The answer was Clear Edge, where Deborah's channeled her decades of personal and business experience into a unique consulting practice that focuses on science-based training, coaching, and consulting. She uses a combination of techniques to help pro athletes and business leaders explore their psyche and reprogram their hearts and brains for the future they wish to create. Welcome, Deborah, back to Bump in the Road. Deborah, welcome back to Bump in the Road. If you would, um, set the stage a little bit for what you're doing these days, because it's absolutely fascinating, and I'd love to talk about it in some depth. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And what I'm doing nowadays is I'm working with um, really leaders in small to medium-sized businesses and their teams, Uh, and we can talk a little bit about what I mean when I talk about a team, Um, to really look at how can we change the landscape of leadership from what it used to be to what it is required now uh, in order to build teams within companies and to get the most productivity uh, out of the employees as well as have everyone uh, really enjoy the experience. How do you start getting people on the same page? Um, As I I look across a a corporate landscape, we have all these individual players and they all have their perspective on things and getting everybody to buy into, I think, a common set of values or a common goal. It's not easy. No, it isn't easy. Uh, And it really starts at the top, which is why I start at the top <laughs> because it's it's that kind of that waterfall effect type of thing that, you know, we have too many leaders that will uh, say all the right things, but then their behaviors don't exemplify that. And we as humans, no matter who we are, what level we are in a company or it just in life, um, no matter who we are, we're going to really believe people's behaviors much more than we're going to believe their words. So I always start at the top, preferably with, uh, you know, CEO uh, or whatever the name of the position is in a particular company and their uh, executive or C-suite team, uh, and then really teach them to become, um, instead of leading a team from a hierarchical standpoint of do as I say because I'm the smartest one in the room and haven't you seen my business card, I've got a title to go with it, but to really look at What are the questions they need to be asking in order to learn the most from their team? And the team could be peer, you know, peer group, uh, or it could be their team, those that are working uh, with and for them uh, in order to get the best solution to whatever issue might be coming up. Or to even look at an opportunity and say, how could we look at this opportunity new and different? And is it the right opportunity for us? And more brains really are better when the brains are not driven from ego and actually driven from um, a common goal. What are, how do you go about evaluating somebody where they are? What are some of the traits or characteristics you look for? Well, much of it I do uh, in the beginning when I'm working with a, uh, say, a company is I will interview the stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, oftentimes people get the idea, oh, that means the board or that means the upper echelon. Really, the stakeholders are anybody that when you make a decision is affected by that decision. Um, So that could even be family. I don't necessarily interview the family, but it could even be the family because they have a stake in the decision you make or don't make. Uh, 
So I interviewed the, um, a mixed group of people within the company to get their points of view. And at the same time, I'm gathering both the language of the company, depending on what industry they're in. I'm getting to know their terminology, but also the language of the individual and their position. Um, it's just like when I'm working with NFL players, you know, how offense, defense, and special teams have different language, and they have different language to different positions, and they have different personalities to fit that position. So in a company, if I'm talking to, say, if it was in construction, I'm talking to an estimator or somebody in accounting in, in any business, financial person, they're typically going to be very analytical, very detailed. If I'm talking to sales, they're going to be much more blue sky, uh, lots of great ideas. And it's finding out um, how can the two work together to come up with that best solution. So it's really through conversation and uh listening to tone and tempo of the voice as well as the specific words that they're using to describe what they do or what they like or don't like within their position or within the company. It seems to me that self-awareness comes into this equation too. And everybody's going to be at a different place in that spectrum. Do you address the idea that a more self-aware person is going to most likely behave a little differently than one who's not? I do address it. Um, I address it in several ways. Number one, self-aware, you're absolutely right. Uh, right. It is the key to um, all the decisions you're going to make and all the decisions that um, uh, you've made in the past and you're going to make in the current and in the future. Because as we start to know and understand ourselves, we can better know and understand others around us at the same time. And when that occurs, the decisions we make, we go back to that instead of being ego-driven, we're aware of our faults, we're aware of our strengths, and um, we are we can become aware that we don't need to feel threatened because somebody else in the room might have a greater um, knowledge bank of skills and, and talent in a particular area. Uh, we look at the individual. One of the things that I teach is called, and I wrote about it in my second book, the um, uh, self-identity. Who am I? As a person, uh, originally back in the day when I first started out in the world of construction and I wrote my self-identity statement uh, for me, first one I ever wrote, didn't have a name for it yet, uh, it was something like, I'm tenacious, I'm gutsy, I'm street smart, uh, I ask a lot of really smart questions and I expect answers uh, and I will do whatever it takes uh, to move ahead within my value system. Um, I've now narrowed that down to just saying I get my Chicago on because <laughs> I'm originally from Chicago. <laughs> but I work with individuals, um, no matter who they are, any of my clients, they're always high achievers, to figure out what is their self-identity and not looking backwards, who were you, and not necessarily even looking at who are you right now. It's looking at contextually who do you need to become in order to reach the goals that you are uh, saying that you desire to achieve. And then we move into that new self-identity and become it now, which means then that future goal comes a lot quicker. That's a very value-driven approach. Absolutely. And um, I'll say something about values, too, because I find too often people do values based on, you know, here's a list of values, uh, you know, go through and highlight or circle the ones that seem, you know, most like you, and then go back and pick your top 10 and then go down to your top three or whatever, and ta-da, that's you. Um, I don't like that system. <laughs> as you can probably tell from my tone of voice. When I do values, I do them as emotional values. And it's fairly simple. Within an hour's call, I can work with somebody to find, uh, help them discover their emotional values, not only the emotions that drive them, but also uh, the emotions that will stifle them and make them turn away from something. Uh, it's the emotions that, let's say, uh, if I were going to get up in front of the group, and if I were a group, and doesn't matter who they are, a group of peers, let's say, and I was saying, "Well, I'm afraid to get up there." Get up there. Well, fear is not is not the issue. 
what could be driving underneath there is that I will feel, uh, let's say, ashamed if I make a mistake. Uh, and that could be coming from my past. You know, so I'm, again, I'm making this up as an example, but there's an underlying reason. So now if I look at if shame were one of my uh, uh, emotional values that would keep me from moving forward in something, when I'm getting ready to make a decision, I can ask, is there anything about this, whether I move forward or stay uh, and do nothing, that my decision is being driven somehow by a shame that I think I might feel? It may not be real. But it's a shame that I can understand now and, and not be ashamed of my shame. <laughs> oh, but simply well, recognize kind of it. This, yeah, now this kind of leads into the idea of imposter syndrome, which I think is all ego driven, actually. Um, and if one could pause and look within, that is truly where the answers lie. Absolutely. The problem that. Um, Many don't understand, not all, but many don't understand uh, because they try to do all the uh, shelf help and, uh, you know, those type of things. Uh, I will tell, you know, potential clients, well, try to tickle yourself. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, if you try to tickle yourself, you're not going to laugh. You know, it's the same thing with trying to do work on yourself. You know, I've got 40 plus years of studying all the neuroscience, brain research, NLP, hypnosis, body language, conscious language, behavioral psychology, sports psychology, you name it. I can study, you know, I can talk about angels and spirit guides or I can talk about synapses and brain body feedback loops. So I've got the science and the spirituality both. Um, and at the same time, there's a certain amount of work that I can do on myself, and I do, but there's also those times when I need to call somebody else who has enough strength to stand up to my thoughts or my belief systems that are not true, but they've got a hold on me, and I need someone else to be able to hold that strength or that power uh, to help me walk through the fire to the other side and to do it quickly rather than going through the day-to-day -day suffering. Let's just do it and get it over with. And there's techniques that can help with that. Well, I think confronting our belief systems is one of the keys to finding out on a more authentic level who we are. Uh, and we all have these belief systems and they are almost, they're all false. Well, they're not all false, but there are some that are false. And I, I even wrote, um, uh, it's like truth. It's not truth or consequences. It's truth and consequences. So whatever you believe to be the truth, whether it's true or not, you get the consequences that go with it because you're going to act according to what you believe, even if your belief is false. You know, I'm really stupid. I can't do math. Well, maybe I was told that all my life. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means that it became a belief system for me because potentially an authority told me that. So therefore, as a young person, I believed it. So since I believed it, it must be true until I prove it not to be true. And I become the greatest mathematician working at NASA or someplace and going, whoa, okay, I get it now. So what are some of the other beliefs that have been driving me that I may need to take a look at? Yeah, no, um, I, I think back over my life, I have, and I think about, back on, on some of the belief systems I've absorbed from others, and it takes a lot of courage to dispel them, and even when you dispel them, those thoughts can linger, and how do you get rid of those thoughts? You may not, because <clears throat> uh, thoughts are um, emotional, as well as the actual thought that you're having, so let's take an instance. Uh, so I've worked with clients over the years as uh, business professionals and that as well as myself. Um, so I'll use myself as the example. When I was 12 years old, my uh, this is back in the Chicago area, small town, about uh, 2,200 people, I think it was at that time. It's a lot more now. No, it was about 8,800 people. It's a lot more now. Um, anyway, five days before Christmas, small town. Uh, I'm 12 years old. My 16-year-old brother was killed in a car accident. I created s several that I've identified now and continue to work through, several beliefs based on that because it's an immediate 
you know, just snap of energy that grabs all the emotion, all the uh, thoughts, all the labels that we put to it unknowingly, subconsciously, um, and we hold them within. So when my parents, my parents were at a Christmas event and my brother had been at a church event, he'd gotten in a car accident, my parents came home. I was at home baking cookies for a Christmas dance with my girlfriend, so I'd been singing Christmas carols and we had the lights on and it was snowy outside and all that. They came home, and one of the things I heard from my dad, I don't know the exact words, but it was something to the effect, Stevie died, he lost control of his car, and he, he died, something along that. So control, boom, became something in my belief system that I need to be in control because if I'm not, something bad is going to happen. Wow. Fun, fun was part of it because I was having fun singing and whatever. There was a part of me that at that point in time went, don't have too much fun because some kind of pain or something may happen. Now, they were labeled. They were subconscious. They became something that later years I got to the point of saying, you know, I can't say his name without bursting into tears as an adult. Um, I can't smell Aquanet hairspray without bursting into tears. Um, and that's what really started my journey 40, 50 years ago, probably more than that now, sad to say. <laughs> well, it's not sad. It's okay to say um, <laughs> that I started studying all the different sciences to find out what is going on with this emotional upheaval that I'm carrying within me and don't have the answer to do something about Um so that's why I started looking at how do you work with trauma and drama and things like that from the past and how do they affect your current um, and your future and decisions as well, business decisions or life decisions. What is the key to releasing the energy of that experience? The key is to work with the emotions because the it's an um, it's the emotions. Keep in mind the statement emotions are the glue to memory. It's a PTSD or a form of PTSD um, that sits in a different part of the brain that's more embedded in the brain, that it, uh, and it's embedded in the emotional system as well. So we can get triggered. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to using myself as an example because I don't want to share other stories of, of people. Well, no, I will. There's a, uh, a client of mine who, back when she was young, had girls on the playground uh, making fun of her. And um, there were statements that were made, something about being ugly, something about, you know, something along those lines. And now as a full woman adult, very successful businesswoman, um, she was carrying that belief system that I'm ugly and, I'll, you know, I'll never make anything of myself. Uh, I had a gentleman who uh, was an entrepreneur, and he had an instance in his childhood when he was um, in a school play. And he was young. There was, some of his buddies were in the play and stuff. He messed up a line. The buddies kind of bumped him on stage and laughed a little bit. Of course, the audience laughed a little bit. Uh, when, he, when the uh, stage performance was over and he was getting ready to go home, his aunt was late in picking him up. And when she did pick him up, then she hollered at him because she was late, not that it makes sense, but it does. Uh, in his mind, it was having that lead role. He was the lead in the play, having that lead role that he should not ever be a leader because it was painful. Subconscious, didn't realize it, called me we, as a client. He texted me and said, we need to talk as soon as we can. Picked it up and he says, I've got an opportunity where um, um, – I can put together a team of other entrepreneurs. I need to lead it. And it's a very big agreement, um, and it will change all of our lives because of the um, notoriety to it as well as the dollars attached to it. But he was afraid to be a leader. In all of those cases, mine and all the, the others, the two that I mentioned, it was working with the emotional system to understand the language and the feelings that are associated with that memory and then basically calling the memory out of what part of that is actually true or not. And then how do you want to think or feel about, let's say, leadership that's different than the way they felt before and then making sure that new feeling becomes the embedded feeling, the new belief, which is changing the, 
um, synapses of the brain to create a new a new memory around it and take away the you don't forget the memory the memory is always going to be there but you um, uh, take away the the sting of the emotion. The neuroplasticity of our brains is just stunning. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that we can rewire it on an emotional basis as well as a mechanical basis opens the door to so many possibilities. Absolutely. Uh, I'll go back to, uh, for a moment, working with NFL players. Um, I can, well, I've worked with golfers and that as well, and a little, little bit of baseball. Um, and I do the same thing with my business leaders that, let's go back to, say, a football player that was injured um, and was told he was never going to play again because of the injury and the type of position that he had. And once he went through surgery, because I'd ask him, I said, well, either, you know, we have a couple options here, and this is all over the phone. Um, speaking of which, um, and he, uh, I told him we have a couple options here. I said, we can uh, hang up the phone. I'll say my prayers for you and, um, uh, you know, hope that all, all goes well. Um, and you, you know, you owe me no more, no more money. We just move forward. Um, or I can work with you uh, over the phone through rehab and let's get you back on the field. And he said, let's go. So everything we did, this is the retraining of the brain, the neuroplasticity, the, the body and the energy of the emotion was uh, a combination of some mirror therapy, some um, emotional visual, deep, deep, deep visualization of seeing his arm healing, sending color, sending energy through it uh, to make sure that he knew the ways to de-stress his body because stress will, um, it'll stall the healing process. And he figures we cut about two months off of the normal rehab that would, you would go through. Uh, and he got picked up and he was back in the league playing. And we would do things, even like when he was starting to go through physical therapy, I'd have him visualize himself in the training room before he ever went there, um, the rehab facility, picking up weights. I never told him what weights to pick up. This was all in his visualization. I would take him into a light you know, trance and take him deep into seeing the colors, the smells, the, the shapes, everything. Um, he'd pick up the weight. I'd have him go over to the bench, take your position, and, you know, lifting the weights, whatever weight he chose on that day, and the way he chose to move them. If he started having problems in his visualization with the one arm not moving as it should, he had torn his tricep 80%. Um, then we would look at, okay, well, let's, how about if we just bring a spider web, kind of like Spider-Man, let's bring that spider web down and wrap it around your hand and let that help bring it up. Um, let's challenge it against the other arm, like the other arm that was strong. And you have to pick and choose. He had to pick and choose. I gave him examples. You know, the other arm telling him, you wuss, you know, come on, let's get that done. You know, talking to one arm to the other. Or the one arm saying, come on, you can do it. He had to choose which way would work best for him. But no matter what way he was doing, he was doing it mentally, emotionally, and physiologically, which are the three pillars to how you change anything, even a good habit uh, to enhance it or a bad habit to change it to a good habit or belief. How, you do a lot of work with um, uh, athletes. How did you get into that? <laughs> uh, well, I'm a Chicago girl, first of all, so I love sports. <laughs> um, and I've done, you know, great white shark dives and used to play sports in high school, but they didn't have sports in high school like they have now. So it wasn't, it was like after school stuff for girls. Um, once I got out here and started, uh, after I sold my um, construction company, I, um, I had a marketing person. And I told him, I said, I want to work with some sports as well. I'm working with business professionals. And he said, well, I'll go out to some of the high schools and see if we can talk to the coaches, see if we can get you in to talk to some of the players. And I was, excuse the language, but bullshit. I said, I want to work with the NFL. You go find me people to talk to. I need to talk to former players, to agents, to trainers, to anybody that I need to talk to to understand what it's like, to understand what's my best entry point, and to understand more about what the players go through. I understood football. I needed to understand more about the actual players. 
Um, and then I went to, it's called the Combine. It was always in uh, Indianapolis at the time where the top uh, 300 players are invited. You have to be invited to go there and work out in front of all the 32 teams. And uh, you can't attend it, but I could be there for it. And there were other events that I could attend, including uh, an event where I talked to all the agents uh, in one room because they had to be there. The NFL required that they be there. Uh, once a year to keep their certification. And I let them know that I would work with up to three of their players, not the guys that were at the combine, the guys that were free agents, the guys that were on the line. I would work with up to three of them over the phone. Um, uh, and the goal was, or not the goal was, but the uh, agreement was that at the end of it, I would do it at no cost, that... Um, I would get uh, referrals, and not, well, referrals and testimonials, both from the agent and from the player. So luckily, I had a couple agents pick me up on that. Uh, I worked with several of the players, and the players that I worked with all made it into the NFL. Now, we have to realize they were already skilled and talented. They weren't the 300, but they were skilled and talented. But what, what happens to any of us is when we're under stress, our body becomes weak, our mind becomes cluttered. And the um, opportunity to perform well when they had to go through their pro development days and such in front of the scouts, uh, their opportunity to mess up or not do as well as they could uh, became that much greater. So by working with them and teaching them the tools and techniques into how to manage their mind and emotions, be mentally tough and emotionally resilient, um, they were able to outperform others who may have on any other given day, maybe had outperformed them. And many of them did better than they had ever done in the past, even in practice. So that helped break me in. Emotional resilience is you know, kind of an interesting idea mm -hmm. uh, and necessary as you go through life. What are the components? How do you build emotional resilience? Well, first think about the difference between willpower. So I can will myself to a certain point to do something, any of us can, but there comes, an, there comes a point where emotions begin to rule. So willing is mm, a lot more from the mental. I can do this. I'm tough. I'm whatever you're talking yourself to all the positive self-talk, which that's a whole nother topic as well. Um, because to me, positive self-talk is only good as long as you're positive. Uh, as soon as you go under stress, positive self-talk doesn't work very well. Now you go down to it's got to be a belief system, so you have to build the emotional component with it. It's mental, emotional, physiological. Again, we're looking at all three. So the resilience, when you can build that belief system, which means building the emotional aspect of it a lot with visualization. I do a lot with visualization, deep visualization, so it embeds it into that uh, memory bank and the emotional body, head body, um, that, yes, I can do this. This is possible. I've seen it. I've felt it. I smelt it. I heard it. Every component is in there. Um, then the ability to be resilient when it's most, most needed is already embedded. It's a go-to. It becomes the default to go to as rather than the default of fear and scrambled and I don't know what to do. The default becomes, all right, all right, let's take a breath. Let's see, what's the end result I want to achieve here? All right, if I know what that is, well, how do I get there? I know where I am. I know where I want to go. How do I fill that gap? What are some of the things that I can bring up? Building, and I call those results-based questions. So you start understanding how to ask yourself a question, the right question, a results-based question, because the brain is meant to solve problems. You give it a question, it'll solve the problem. Why did I screw up? Well, it'll tell you all the reasons you screwed up, so now you've just embedded that into your mind deeper and into your emotional system. If you ask it, what could I do new and different, now it's going to give you those answers. Well, that's a lot more helpful. So it's a combination of all of those things, and part of it depends on the person because it's always going to be um, personalized to the individual and their language. Because let's say if you were to tell me, uh, if I were to ask you some questions and stuff, and I said, well, how do you feel about X? And you say, well, I'm, you know, it frustrates the hell out of me. And I go, oh, okay, so it worries you. Well, you didn't say that it worries you. 
You said it frustrates the hell out of you. I need to use your words because that's what your emotional body knows, and that's the words that it's used to label how you feel. So I don't want to relabel it because you might go, yeah, that's right, because they are similar. But your emotional body is going, uh, 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 not what I said. That's not what I told you. So it becomes personalized in those ways. And frustration isn't necessarily fear. I mean, it can be many different things. Absolutely. Well, and we use frustration and worry. So frustration could be based on worry. Worry could be based on the frustration that you're feeling regarding whatever it is that you're doing or seeing or thinking about. Uh, but again, that's why they're not interchangeable. And different for everybody. I think of frustration, I think of a, a block of some sort, a wall, and that goes to authority often. Ah, see? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But you also see, if we go back to the conversation we had earlier about emotional values, your emotional values are going to be different than mine. We may... <sighs> We may act in similar ways as far as our desire to be helpful and kind and all that type of thing, but what drives it is going to be different. You will have a different label for why it is that you feel that way and you act in that way. We may act in similar ways, but what the driving factor is, that emotional value is going to be different for each of us. Now, emotion is definitely energy. And it can take us in a lot of directions. It seems to me that until you start to understand the emotion, you can't really set a goal because your, your goal is the outcome of all that energy, emotional energy, psychological energy, physiological energy. Um, it, it seems like you have to break it down to even set a goal. Um, because I pick on words a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't okay. break in. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't break anything. Um, so I wouldn't break it down. So that would be one of the things. As mm -hmm. again, and my clients get to the point they can barely talk sometimes because they're, <laughs> they're and I because they're listening to their own words before they say them. Um, you can set a goal. It doesn't mean you're going to reach it. And if you set yeah. the goal and it's really based on what other what you think other people want you to do, then it's not really your goal. It's just a goal. Um, I do a lot with, um, uh, again, we go back to vision. I go past the logical mind, the default mind of what somebody's goal might be, and I'll take them out into the future, um, sometimes close to 20 years before they'll really hit on, oh, yeah, no, that's what I really, that's what I'm really, I really want. I did this with, a, uh, I'll go back to an NFL player once. I took him out into the future. Um, and he was sitting in a bar with his buddies, with his son, who was now, you know, um, mid-teens at that point. Uh, no, it was later than that because we were out 20 years. Um, and they were telling stories about being in the NFL and sharing stories about their family. So what was really driving him, even in football, was really that family, the camaraderie, the, the love and the um, uh, relationship he had with his son. So knowing that that was a driving factor and it was towards those feelings, the goal wasn't necessarily, well, I want to be sitting in a bar with my buddies and whatever. The goal was to have those feelings. So we can work with those feelings that he's wanting to have in the future and start finding ways for him to have them now. So whatever the future brings him, it brings him to a point where it's those feelings that he's enjoying on the journey as well as at the end of the journey. In the sports world, you're talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. In the business realm, you're talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, but you're also, well, I guess in both cases, you're dealing with an organization. Right. Are there elements of integrating all these to individual tools into an organizational structure? Absolutely. Um, last year, I worked with uh, a global corporation. Again, everything was virtual. Uh, 41 of their women, starting with the CEO, who was a woman, uh, her C-suite, the women in the C-suite, they were also men in the C-suite, but she wanted this group to be all women. So the women that were in the C-suite and then the management level underneath that, and some were in different countries and some were in different parts of the U.S. Uh, so when I would do a training, one of the things that was important for me 
and for them was to put them in breakout rooms with exercises to do so they could start to understand different perceptions. I also moved them into cohorts that they uh, worked within. And the cohorts, uh, there were three in a cohort, and they worked uh, whenever we weren't in training and things like that. But throughout the throughout the month, they would meet at least once a month. They started meeting much more often than that, several of the groups. Um, but there were, within a three-person cohort, there would be maybe somebody from C-suite, maybe somebody from uh, whatever the lowest level of that high group was, and, and somebody from, you know, different departments. So we made sure it was mixed up. And the thing that I got back from that, from all of them, was, wow, never would have met that person because they, they weren't in my kind of my realm of what I do within my position in the company if I hadn't been in that cohort. Didn't realize how alike we are, no matter where they were in the country or what their position was in the company. They were dealing with different problems, but they were dealing with problems. And there was a humanistic side that they were learning about that... Um, um, they could start to understand about each other. So that was starting to build the camaraderie and the um, the way of valuing different perceptions and diversity, uh, whether whatever what label we put on diversity, whether it's color or religion, parts of the country, parts of the world, uh, upbringing, uh, whatever it might be, they started to learn and understand that even if you're not in sales, you're in parts procurement or something, you could potentially help me because you have an outside view and vice versa. Or because you are, you know, at a different place in touching the customer, you can give me a different perspective, which can help me when I'm talking to my client. So it was really interesting. And it opened up the um, conversation between the upper you know, the C-suite CEO, because CEO was involved in all this as well. Um, and those who were one or two levels in the organization lower started to open up that conversation. And the women got to know themselves so much better that I had one woman. Uh, she was, uh, throughout the year, she got, I think it was three, um, three not just raises, but position changes to where she ended up being director of uh, sales at the end of it all, because that was within her. And yet she made the comment that because she was, her parents were from another country um, and she lived in a really dangerous part of the city that where she was raised, uh, she never thought she could ever be anything but a worker bee. Um, and here she was just opening up the possibilities, which I love doing is um, mentoring uh, the next generation of leaders um, that are just phenomenal. Now, you mentioned you would ask a question to elicit some different perceptions. What's an example of the type of question you would ask? Is it a human question, an emotional question, a business question? Yes. Um, it depends. On, it de everything depends on the situation and the person. It's always going to be an open-ended question. It's always going to be a question that's going to get them to stop and think for a moment. Um, so I also teach a little bit of improv uh, for difficult conversations and that, just in languaging and such. So it could be, huh, well, that's interesting. Well, I understand where you're coming from, and would you be open to thinking about a different way? You know, and then what's that next question? What's the next question? So it's what most people do, not all, most people do is they ask a question, they get an answer, and they're done. Or they're looking to how do they defend their per uh, perception. If instead we keep that open, inquisitive mind, nothing being right or wrong, everything just being interesting, well, that's interesting. So how would you go about doing that? You know, what are some of the elements of that particular thing? Um, if we were to do that, how do you think that would play out for um, the, cl the client? You know, it, and you just keep asking, because when you're asking the question of somebody else, your brain is hearing the question. So it's coming up with different perspectives as well. So you can play this game with yourself, and it works really well, and you can play it with others, and you're actually playing it at the same time. 
What are your goals with your consulting business? Well, I started this whole thing really with the underlying truth of um, I'm looking to stop people's struggle. And the struggle is the struggle that they have within. If, if and when there is a person within a group, just a person within a group, that there's that light bulb that comes on, that shift of how they act within uh, and behave. I work a lot on behaviors. Behave within a company or within a group within a company or a department within a company. What I also start hearing is how they act at home and how it helps with their relationships with their loved ones, whether it's a spouse or a partner or children or whoever it might be, so it spreads. And my goal is really to uh, not touch as many people as I can, to touch the right people who are the high achievers, who listen and learn and implement, and then they keep repeating it. Um, because they become, they become my teachers for me, my coaches for me, not necessarily knowingly, but they do. Uh, and that just warms my heart when I hear stories coming back to me of how they've contributed to the ener energy of the world as well, their world and the greater world. That's fulfilling for me. That fills my heart. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.